This podcast is sponsored by Lightens. Lightens, your best source for OE quality automotive and heavy duty accessory drive tensioning devices. We know tensioners because we invented them. Larry, good morning and welcome to AMN Drive Time. Great to have you with us this morning. Good morning, Bill. It's great to be here. Larry, I've been in the market for about 35 years or so. I think I have either known you or certainly of you for most of that time. That said, I was wondering if you could just give us a uh, synopsis of how you got started in the industry and, and how you've ended up now as the CEO of the Automotive Parts Services Group, the group. Well, I'd love to, Bill. And, uh... I have known you for a long time, and I just want to start by saying uh, thank you for all that you do for the industry. Obviously, uh, you and your company are are great supporters of our industry and, and do some really important work. I'm already breaking one of my rules, which is to never follow uh, John Washbish on one of these things because he is so uh, dynamic and uh, effervescent that I, I'm... I'm gray and boring on my best day, but when I follow him, I really look bad. So I, I want you to know that I, I did see his uh, his interview and it was really awesome. So uh, happy to be here and appreciate the opportunity. I, um, I got started in the business uh, a long time ago, uh, a little over 50 years ago, and, and uh, it was a pretty, it was a pretty un, uh, sophisticated start. I was actually uh, mowing the grass at my at my home and my next door neighbor hollered over and said, hey, would you like to make some money uh, today and and working at the auto parts store? So I hopped in the truck, drove to the store and I put uh, actually exhaust away for most of the day. I made 10 bucks, uh, got to hang out at the uh, at the auto parts store. It was pretty exciting. And so uh, the next year, I, I that was before I had a driver's license. So the next year, I actually applied for a driver's job. I uh, was lucky enough to get it actually started as a part-time driver and then uh, got promoted to a, to a full-time driver. And uh, and that's how it started. And, and from there, I worked every summer, every chance I could get, uh, learned how to work the, the counter, memorized the weatherly system. Uh, so it was a... Uh, it was a literally kind of started at the bottom and uh, and have had a great uh, a great opportunity through the years to do a lot of different things got it so larry you spent 30 years on the supplier side with a lot of storied aftermarket manufacturers walker Eklund, dana brates park Brait parts inc to name a few there may be some others in there but i know those for sure uh, there's been a lot of incredible changes in the business over the last 30 years or so. Do any things, do any things stand out in particular to you or several things? And, and did I miss any stops along the way for you, Larry? Maybe you could quickly <laughs> confirm or deny. Well, it, it, it kind of sounds like when you mention them all that I couldn't keep a job, but most of those were, uh, were one stop. So, uh, I worked for Eklund. Uh, Eklund bought uh, the assets of Raybestos out of bankruptcy. I worked on the break side of the business, and then, and then Dana acquired the business. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I started. Uh, so I started working at the parts store. Uh, the parts store actually was owned by a warehouse distributor in Cincinnati, Ohio. So I worked there while I went to school, and then. Uh, and then after that, I my first uh, job in the industry was with Walker Manufacturing. I sold uh, jacks actually back in in those days and, and got promoted to exhaust. People kind of chuckle about that. But and then uh, after that, I I went to work for Eklund and I spent uh, twenty some years there. You know, I, I, obviously there have been tons of changes. I mean, I saw some some incredible changes. I, I think probably the biggest thing is, you know, when I started, a lot of the companies were on the supply side, were family owned businesses. It was a very relationship oriented business. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of, of Felpro and the layman's in Chicago and, and even, uh, you know, Hub Moog was, uh, had just kind of sold the company, but still was a part of it at, at Eklund. Jack Eklund was, uh, 
was still involved in the business. So there was a lot of uh, certainly the Sills family at Standard Motor Products. A lot of these uh, businesses were kind of extensions of the families and uh, and kind of had those kind of values. And I think that was a uh, that was a great time. Obviously, the uh, the the business changed, uh, got to be a lot more uh, competitive. I think that you know there were a lot of good things that happened. There were there were great processes and. And improvements. I, I think about quality and six sigma and a lot of those things. And and certainly, I think you know one of the things we've seen today is uh, there was a lot of vertical integration kind of back when I started. A lot of people made uh, most of their products, and and some of that certainly has changed with the pressure on asset management and what have you. And it makes the supply chain a lot more uh, challenging today, uh, without question. So. But, but I think the, the one thing that hasn't changed, it's still a great business with, with tremendous opportunities for anybody that, you know, is willing to work hard in, uh, and it's still a relationship business, maybe not as much as it was, but still certainly a, a relationship business where people do business with people and, and help each other. And, and, uh, and that's what I love about it. I agree. It's still a relationship business, even with competition and all the new technology, et cetera. People are still doing, people are still doing business with people in the aftermarket. And you see you it when you see it when you go to the shows, right? Do, Absolutely. Do, do you have any plans for the show in November? Is it still, uh, what are you guys thinking as of now? Well, we're obviously looking forward to it. It's been a, uh, it's been a challenging time. Although I have to say, if, if you'd have told me that, uh, you know, we could go a year and, and travel very little and, and, uh, still be able to maintain our, our business and our relationships and communications, I would have been, uh, probably a little astonished, but, uh, but we all figured it out and we made it through, but I think it's going to be great to get back together. I think we're looking forward to, uh, certainly we're going to, we're going to have a number of teams there. We're going to go with the uh, idea that, you know, it's not going to be back to normal. I'm not sure that normal is ever going to be a word that we throw around again, but it is going to be great to get back and to, to see people, to be able to talk uh, with folks to, and I know AWDA we're really looking forward to. And I think, you know, and a lot of times the, the collaboration that happens at industry events uh, goes beyond you know, just the business, uh, the opportunity to be able to to talk to people socially, to catch up with families, et cetera. I think that's that's all part of the fabric of our business. And and that's the thing that's tough to do on a Zoom call. So we're really excited about it. Terrific. So, Larry, you you uh, went over to the uh, uh, to the distribution side from the supplier side. How many years ago was that now? Uh, I was about uh, 14 years ago. So 14 years ago, you've been at it a while, of course. Any noticeable, what were the differences for you? How was that transition? Obviously, 14 years, you've taken it to it well. Any comments on being on the different sides? Well, you know, I actually started on the distribution side or the parts store side and warehouse side when I was young. So. You know, I think as I uh, I spent a lot of time on the supplier side, I enjoyed every minute of it. Um, and and to be honest with you, some of the greatest times that I had on the uh, on the manufacturing side was when we were kind of small and the business was uh, was intimate. You worked closely with people. It was all about you know kind of working together in somewhat of a team environment to offset things. And then you know we were lucky and the business grew and it got to be. Uh, a pretty large business where uh, things changed. I, I think the one thing about the distribution side of the business is, is just that. I think it's working, you know, closer with people, uh, being able to have those kind of relationships, being mentored and doing some mentoring at the same time, hopefully taking some of the things that, uh, that I'd learned through the years, both on the distribution and manufacturing side, being able to apply those and share them. But I think that's the, uh, I think that's the biggest thing is just the opportunity to to work closer with people. Uh, we have some great members of our group that uh, really are are a joy to be around, and, and and they're all in, right? I mean, they their their business is everything, and so 
uh, you really kind of enjoy being able to work with those kind of people and support uh, wherever you can. And, and that's been just a, it's been a really enjoyable thing for me. Terrific. Larry, but you, you, you've had some fabulous experiences, I'm sure, over the years between traveling, being at trade shows, dinners, events. Do anything stand out for you, special memories over the years? Not necessarily pure business related, but just the things you saw, things you witnessed, dinners out and such. Well, uh, you know, not a whole lot that I could talk about. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. Obviously, uh, just a, a lot of tremendous uh, uh, memories and a, and a lot of great uh, opportunities to spend time with, uh, with a lot of, uh, of just great uh, people. I, I think, you know, one of the things I remember early on, um, so when I was with Eklund, they bought uh, Ray Bestis out of bankruptcy and the company had struggled in a, in a lot of different ways for three or four years. And we were working hard to try to get it turned around. And we, we ended up, we had a prospect and, and, uh, and we ended up getting fortunate enough that he agreed to change over and it was a big deal for us, but his stipulation was he didn't want to disrupt his business and he wanted the, the changeover done on Thanksgiving. And, uh, and so we, we had a talk about it and we said, okay, well, if this is what it takes, this is what it takes. So there was about, uh, I don't know, 12 or 15 of us from the company, I felt like if I was going to ask people to work on Thanksgiving, I probably ought to be there with them. And so we, we went, we did the changeover. We changed the warehouse over, started at seven in the morning. We got done around five in the afternoon. And then they, uh, we were staying at a holiday inn and they actually made some uh, turkey and dressing. And so we had a, a Thanksgiving dinner uh, before we started on the jobber changeovers the next day. But but those are the kind of kind of once in a lifetime opportunities to spend time with people that are, you know, just meaningful uh, kind of accomplishments and work and, and also, you know, sharing the, the kind of success. And so I always look back on that. I, I, I would, you know, kind of see some of those people years later and, and it was always, hey, remember Thanksgiving when we did the changeover. So so that was certainly one. And, and uh, you know, kind of on the flip side, that was uh, that was maybe when we were getting started. One of the I guess funnest events. Uh, so we had a, we were in Las Vegas. It was back when, when we were at Caesars and we had a prospect that we were working on. And so the, our sales manager came and said, you know, Larry, he's agreed to have dinner with us tonight and we're going to have dinner at the palace court at Caesars palace. And I think they had two seatings like eight o'clock and 10 o'clock. And I said, I said, well, I hope we got the eight o'clock. He said, no, there wasn't any, seats of it. We're, we're into 10 o'clock. So it was already going to be a late night, but that was okay. So, so we show up at the palace court. We had, uh, I think the prospect had three or four folks with them. And so we had a table of maybe six or eight and we had a wonderful dinner. And it's, if you've ever kind of done it and I'm sure you have, you know, it ends up being a two and a half hour dinner. And, and so near the end, the, uh, the customer, the prospect said to the, to the waiter, so uh is there a show tonight is there a midnight show and and the guy said oh yeah and he said well you know larry could we go to the show and i thought oh lord well this is gonna really become a late night so but i said sure and so he said well who's playing and the waiter said well i'll go find out so he came back and he said it's cool in the gang and i thought to myself okay dodge the bullet there he's not going to want to see cool in the gang and he said, cool in the gang. I love cool in the gang. And so, so we get the tickets, we go to the show. Anyhow, make a long story short, we're 10 minutes into it and everybody's asleep in, in the booth and pretty much stayed that way for the rest of the night. But it was a, uh, just an example of a lot of the fun that, uh, you know, we've kind of had through the years. Those are great stories. Well, I imagine a fun evening for you also was the night you were awarded the leader of the year award. Well, that was a, uh, that was a very special evening. Obviously, uh, my family was there, which, you know, in this business, it's always great when you can share any of the times with the people that, 
you know, helped you so much in uh, certainly having them there and, and the recognition from the industry. It was a uh, it was a humbling experience and certainly one that uh, I'll remember forever and and was you know so grateful and and uh, just to be considered for it was was tremendous. Well, it was very well deserved and that's a very big deal to win that. So, Larry, game changing moments in your career, any flash points that come to mind over your career? And I might combine that with a question because sometimes maybe they're related, maybe they're not. It relates to maybe mentors you had over the years and sometimes mentors can make a difference. Yeah, well, for sure. I mean, and, and I had some great mentors, um, you know, both from a standpoint of people that worked with me and helped me and, and also some that, you know, just watching them and, and how they, uh, you know, how they uh, worked in the business, how they treated people. A lot of times those were important. You know, when at Eklund, I was fortunate enough to work for Fred Mancheski, who was a uh, certainly an aftermarket legend and built a tremendous company. Fred was, uh, he was a taskmaster, but he was fair and he loved the business, loved the customers. And, uh, and so that was a great opportunity. I, our board of directors, uh, Bill Hatcher from genuine parts company was on our board back when customers could still be on a, uh, on a supplier's board. Uh, Jack Creamer was on our board. So, I had uh, great opportunities with uh, those two were tremendous mentors to me. Uh, Wilton Looney at Genuine Parts Company was somebody that I really looked up to and and had a had a good relationship along with a, a lot of other people. I mean, just really too many to mention. But uh, but I did, you know, I, I, I had a couple of great opportunities in uh, in 1991. Eklund had a uh, had a deal with Kawasaki where they would send people to spend some time in our manufacturing plants. And I got to go spend some time in a Kawasaki plant. And, and really it was an eye opening, great experience to learn a different culture. Uh, and, and really the appreciation for having people involved. Uh, the Japanese had a process, have a process called Kaizen, which is, which is getting the people that know the work the best involved in the, in the process and the improvement. And, uh, and that was really, I think it was eye opening for me. It was a, uh, you know, probably some of the best time that I ever spent as far as learning uh, a lot about uh, the business and things that happen. And then uh, I was able to kind of bring some of that back and, and utilize it in our business. And, and uh, that was a, that was a great experience for me. And, and when you talk about, you know, major things that influence you for the future, that that certainly was one of them. I think another one that I, I kind of remember and uh, it really has roots to the uh, some of the business that are some of the people that I deal with today. And in the early 90s, again, we were uh, working hard on the brake business and we were fortunate enough to get uh, uh, some business from Federated and, and Federated was uh, originated and run in those days by Art Fisher and Art was another uh, tremendous mentor and, and a great uh, aftermarket, you know, manager and participant. And, and so we had had the business for a couple of years and, and we had improved a, a great deal from, from where we had started. We had some tough times, but we had gotten better. And, and so one day Art called me up and, and he said, uh, uh, Larry, you know, you're, you're missing a rotor, brake rotor for a Ford Explorer. And I said, really, what year? And uh, this was probably 1994. And he said, well, 1994 Ford Explorer. And I said, well, Art, that's a, that's a new vehicle. I said, uh, those rotors aren't going bad yet. And he said, well, you know, there's, there's some that uh, are used in fleet applications and, and somebody's using one for, so he said, yeah, we did, uh, you know, we had a call for a rotor for a, for a 94 Ford Explorer. So I said, well, you know, nobody's got those yet. So, you know, we're working on it. We'll probably have it soon. And he said, well, quality automotive has got them. And I said, uh, oh, well, that's, that's Martin Chevalier. That's a small business there. He, he probably went to the Ford dealer and bought one. That's probably how he has it. And, uh, 
And Art, it was quiet for a minute and Art said, yeah, you're probably right. Cause I remember when you used to do things like that. <laughs> and I tell you, it was, you talk about eye opening it. it uh, I, I remember I called all my team together and I said, Hey, you know, we, we got to start getting back to our roots, making sure that, uh, you know, we're doing all the things that we need to do to, to take care of our customers and, and make sure that we haven't gotten too big, you know, for the business. And uh, I always said after that, you know, you've got to, even when you get big, you need to figure out how to think small and, and be small. So those are kind of two things that I remember uh, that were, were really kind of things that stick out when I look back at, uh, at things that had a big impact on me. So, Larry, you are now uh, CEO of the group, which includes Federated and Pronto. Pronto recently merged with Automotive Distribution Network, of course, to create the Pronto Network. We're seeing a lot of collaboration today. Where do you see the distri distribution segment headed as a whole? Well, I think, uh, first of all, I think collaboration is, uh, is really what it's all about. I mean, the market is, uh, is complex. There's a lot of different moving parts. And so being able to keep up with all of it, I think requires uh, collaboration, working together. I think from a distribution standpoint, you know, we're all wrestling with some of the same issues, same problems, same challenges. And that's really what brought the, uh, the group together, if you will, is, is trying to find ways to help our members uh, solve some of those things, be more cost efficient, share information, uh, you know, look at things like national accounts where you know, we need to be able to service customers everywhere to be able to compete. Uh, those are all things that are important. And I think they're going to continue to be important. I think the, you know, the market's going to get more complex. There's going to be, if you look at the inventory proliferation today, the proliferation of models, now we're moving into a much more technical and electronic age with the vehicles, with, uh, with driver assist systems that'll turn into, to uh, automated systems and, and autonomous systems. We're talking about, you know, more electrification and, and electric vehicles and hybrids. So I think all of this is a challenge that the distribution sector has to figure out how to, how to react to and how to manage. And so, so collaborating on things like training, collaborating on things like uh, inventory management and, and information, uh, figuring out how to do things more efficiently, doing things once in, instead of having, you know, a hundred distributors doing it themselves every time. Those are all things I think th that will be beneficial for the future. There's going to, there's going to be continued consolidation. There's no question in every industry, not just ours. And, uh, but I think together we, we feel like working together uh, with collaboration, with everybody kind of, kind of pitching in and sharing, if you will, that, uh, you know, this business is going to continue to be very exciting. There's going to be great opportunities. And so, so we feel great about it. And obviously, uh, you know, the, the collaboration, the consolidation is going to continue and, and hopefully we're going to continue to find a way to make it uh, work for everybody. Got it. Larry, you've been uh, a part of companies with great brands over your many years. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on the value of brands and brand reputation. Well, you know, and, and Bill, you're right. I mean, I have been very fortunate and, and I know that, you know, when we talk about things changing, certainly that's one of the things that has changed is there's a, a lot more private brand and, and exclusive brands, proprietary brands today. But, you know, when you, when you think about the business, uh, and, and I don't know the numbers are exact, but it's about, you know, 80% DIFM and 20% or some number close to that DIY. So you've got, you know, the bigger part of the business are people that, uh, that their livelihoods depend on it, uh, that they're, they're kind of all in on the, on the automotive repair side of the business. And so if you're making your living at it, then they, you got to have trust and, and confidence in, you know, not only your suppliers, but the parts that they're supplying. And I think that's where brands come in. You know, brands provide some continuity, if you will, in the marketplace for the guy who's, who's got to make sure or wants to make sure that 
He's using the best stuff that he can use that he can count on it to solve his customers problems that it's going to create uh, value for him. And, and I think, I think great brands do that. I think they do it not only in our business, but other businesses, but, but certainly in ours where, you know, the brand and the, and the reputation of that product is, is so essential to somebody's living and their reputation for their business. And, and so being able to link those two together, I think is important. And I, I think it's always going to have uh, an important place in our business because, you know, people that make their living uh, repairing vehicles, getting information, diagnostics, et cetera, you know, having that brand that they can trust and rely on and, and feel good about and, and promote to their customers, I think is important. Uh, thanks, Larry. We talked briefly about it so far, but the pandemic, any lessons learned personally or professionally in your organizations, things that you're going to take forward that you may not have learned without the pandemic? Yeah, well, one of the things I, I, I say I learned is you never say never and never say always again, right? It, it, uh, it changed all the rules for everything. So, you know, I, I, I think, um, well, you know, personally, I think what it, it kind of reminded me of the, the great value and sometimes the things that we take for granted, you know, all of a sudden, you know, being able to go out to uh, even, you know, go and get a cup of coffee became a challenge, you know, being able to, uh, to do some of the things that we took for granted, some of the, the freedoms that we have, not only in our country, but just in our society, in our lives, I think it really was a reminder of how precious those are. And, uh, you know, when you kind of get to my age, you get to that point where, you know, sometimes you forget about those things and, and just how valuable they are. So I think personally, that's, that's what it did to me is it just was a, a reminder and a wake up call of just how precious, you know, some of the freedoms that we have and some of the opportunities that we have in our, in our society, in our lives. I think, you know, professionally, it was really just understanding and, and seeing how, you know, people pulled together, even though there was, there were certainly a lot of different, you know, opinions and, and, uh, but when push came to shove, you know, people pulled together to, to kind of help each other. When you talk about, you know, some of the frontline workers and I include people in our industry in that, uh, we had a meeting not long ago where we reminded that, you know, all of the heroes that were out there were, were supported by the heroes in our industry, people that uh, allowed transportation, you know, for doctors and nurses and firefighters and what have you to be able to get to, to their jobs and do their jobs all kind of depended on our industry. And so to see people kind of step up and, and really perform at remarkable levels when there were plenty of challenges, plenty of difficulties, um, I thought was really special. And so, uh, again, I mean, it, it may sound uh, a little bit corny, but I, I really felt like, uh, you know, from a standpoint of the, of the human side of this thing, even though a pandemic is, uh, is about as terrible a thing as you could ever have. It really kind of showed the, uh, the special essence of our society and our humanness in, uh, and I thought, you know, it's one of the things that if there's anything positive that comes out of this, I think that's one of them. E-commerce, Larry, it's exploded over the last year, even more than it had in previous years. How did the group prepare for it? How's it taken advantage of it? What does it look like moving forward? Yeah, well, it certainly, uh, it, cer it certainly exploded uh, during the pandemic for sure. And, uh, you know, fortunately, we have uh, some very talented folks that uh, were able to pivot pretty quickly. I mean, a lot of our members were already doing uh, e-commerce, but certainly uh, everyone had to look at it during the pandemic. If nothing else, for uh, order online, maybe pick up in the store or, you know, some people wanted things uh, shipped because they didn't want to come out and visit a store. So, so we had to work uh, really uh, hard to get uh, some new processes in place to support members. Again, uh, we've got a great team of uh, professionals. They they work quickly and got some got some things put together to to help our members. And uh, 
And I think, you know, in, in some ways it was probably good. It expedited the process. It, it allowed us to, to kind of maybe get to where we needed to get to overall anyhow. And, um, but it was a, uh, it was certainly a challenge. It'll continue to be, you know, the online sector is, is different. It's, uh, it's a lot more complex. There's a lot, a lot of different players there. And so it'll continue to be a challenge. I think it's going to be, uh, you know, we're going to see it continue. When you look at the number of older vehicles out there, which are, are really kind of the engine for the DIY business and, and, uh, and you look at part proliferation, inventory proliferation, the difficulty in finding parts. Those are both things where the internet is going to provide some value. And so we've got to find a way to, to kind of tap into that, to use it as uh, effectively as we can. And, and again, we've got, you know, we've got great members that, uh, you know, have some great capabilities, great vision. And so, you know, our job is to, just to support them and uh, make sure they've got the tools that they need and, and then stay out of the way. So it's a, uh, it's an ongoing battle for sure. But one, I think that, uh, that we feel good about. Electric, uh, electric vehicles, Larry, it's had a lot of, a lot of news over the last couple of years. And even, even the last 30 days, a lot more news about electric vehicles, right? And some interesting supposed mandates moving forward. Those aren't locked in stone, of course. What is your view of electric vehicles? Well, you know, I, I said it's like a lot of things. If you uh, if you just paid attention to what you read and, and heard, you would think that electric vehicles are are 50 percent of the vehicle population today. And, and uh, you know, in a very short period of time, they'll they'll take over. You know, I, I kind of understand. I mean, I, I kind of have maybe two views. I have a, a, a one view that says, you know, I think that when you build a better mousetrap and that's what we've always done throughout our history, you know, people will will take advantage of it. They'll support it. And and certainly I think Tesla had a great uh, start at building electric vehicles that uh, the consumers liked. I'm not sure they were affordable enough, but certainly they were uh, working in that direction. But I worry sometime about mandates because I think they undermine innovation and creativity. And you end up with, you know, I saw a, a quote yesterday by uh, by somebody that said, you know, none of this is going to work without, you know, huge tax subsidies and, and things of that sort. So, you know, what I hope is, I hope that uh, that really we kind of get behind it from a technology standpoint and create good, uh, you know, electrification processes, whatever they may be, uh, whether they're hybrid or semi-hybrid or hydrogen, or, you know, I think that uh, there's a lot of different technologies out there that can be looked at when we look at uh, clean air. But, but certainly I think even if things go as quickly as, uh, as the suggestions are now, and, and it's, it's kind of interesting. I, I just looked at, I was preparing a, uh, a presentation. So I look back at some old quotes in, uh, in the CEO of General Motors about six months ago said it's going to take decades for electric vehicles to become relevant. And last month she said, you know, they're going to do it in five years. So we've, we've been able to change the narrative pretty quickly, but, but ultimately, you know, electric vehicles are going to become a bigger part of the fleet. Uh, we're going to, we're going to manage them. I think it's not going to be a, uh, a big negative for the aftermarket, as I said, you know, the, there's a lot of new stuff that comes on the vehicle today that will replace anything that goes away. And ultimately the repair and maintenance of electric vehicle, especially as it becomes an autonomous vehicle is going to be uh, more important than it ever was. The, the, the amount of work and parts and repair and service is going to increase, not decrease. And so whatever the, the rate is that the market gets electrified. I don't, I don't see it as a negative. I think it's going to be a positive for our industry. It'll force some changes. It'll make, uh, it'll make some new opportunities appear. There are going to be new opportunities for shops and technicians that have, you know, new information and, and diagnostic capabilities. Certainly there are going to be new parts and, and, uh, and things from a supply standpoint. So lots of, uh, of new opportunities, but, 
you know, those are th times when our industry thrives, when, when you have kind of those large technical changes. I've seen it throughout the years with, you know, electronic ignition and fuel injection and disc brakes and all these things that were going to, you know, just destroy us. And, uh, and they end up being good. And I think this will be too. So Larry, in, in my career, I'm a little bit of an inch wide and a mile deep. I've been in the automotive aftermarket. I got out of college. I worked for the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company and in their company-owned stores. And then when, went to work for our family business, where I've had the privilege to be for my entire career. And Larry, for me, I've had so many opportunities in the aftermarket that I never even dreamed of and so many relationships that are too many to even count. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on just kind of that general theme. Well, I think, um, I think Bill, I would, I would probably echo that, uh, you know, the, the, the opportunities that, that I've had, um, you know, I grew up in a small town. Um, uh, I, I grew up working with my family until, uh, until I got, uh, the chance to work in an auto parts store and, and probably today when, when someone would hear that that was kind of the highlight, you know, of, of my life, the opportunity to start working in an auto parts store, but it, but it really was, it was a, uh, it was an opportunity to work with, uh, with a good group of people who were kind of dedicated. I, I remember, you know, being able to work the parts counter and, and, uh, and always thinking to myself, you know, that this is an opportunity to help somebody who's got a problem, uh, solve a problem, create some, some value, and uh, and so it's it's kind of been that way from from day one, the opportunity to to work in a great business where you're working with great people and with opportunities to to do some uh, what I consider important things. Um, you know, there's a lot of people in, in our industry that uh, that have had great success. And certainly, you know, I look back in and, and the. Uh, the number of people that kind of went before me, the people that created uh, this business, this industry, uh, really that those are the people that, that I'm thankful for. I'm thankful for the, the people that I got to work with that uh, all the different assignments that I had, just, you know, tremendous people that would work hard to, to support, uh, you know, whatever the business needed, whatever they were asked to do. And, and so, you know, when I kind of look back on, on my career, it's one that, you know, at my age, you kind of shake your head about and just say, man, how in the world did I get lucky enough to be able to be uh, where I am today? And, you know, just e even to be able to be here talking with you uh, is a great privilege. And it, and it is one that, uh, you know, there's, there are so many people that I would uh, have to thank. I mean, the, the, it would take uh, hours to be able to go through all the people that that helped me, supported me, uh, were allowed me to ask questions, gave me information. I mean, I just think about uh, so many people. Uh, you know, I mentioned mentors. Uh, Mort Schwartz was a person. You know, Mort was someone who would always talk to me about the non-business side of the business, about giving back, doing things, uh, charitable things. You know, Mort worked. Uh, I worked with Mort at the start of of putting gas together to try to create, you know, scholarships for the industry. So a lot of great people, uh, again, that I owe so much to, and, and I just, I couldn't express it if I, if I had to, my great appreciation for, for all of those people and, and what this business has been able to do for me and my family. Larry, it's been great to uh, visit with you this morning. You've been a terrific interview. Thanks so much for being on AMN Drive Time. Thank you, Bill. I appreciate the opportunity. Good luck. This podcast is sponsored by Lightens. Lightens, your best source for OE quality automotive and heavy duty accessory drive tensioning devices. We know tensioners because we invented them.